We're going to round out our morning session with another Fairfield faculty member. Please welcome Glenn Diner. I'd like to begin by, by acknowledging, as many of us have, Arthur Schick's tremendous contributions to the fight against injustice, which rightly earned him the moniker of soldier artist. Schick used his art to raise awareness, to affect change, and really to awaken Poland's better angels um, by emphasizing Poland's historical tolerance towards Jews. And the latter effort was definitely embodied in his great work, uh, The Statues of Kalisk, which he began producing in 1927. However, since this is a scholarly symposium, I also feel it's incumbent upon me to draw attention to major lacuna in Schick's work for all of his fighting on behalf of the victims of injustice, he remained virtually silent about injustice towards his own community, that is Polish Jewry, throughout the interwar period, uh, which got especially bad in the last five years of the Second Polish Republic. And so I'd like to attempt to address this blind spot, present it more as a question, but also ask the question of what if? What if he had spoken out against that, that kind of injustice? Apologies to those who are big Schick fans. Um, so he begins his Statue of Kalisk with this dedication to Józef Pilsudski, who um, had just achieved power through a coup, an anti-democratic coup, and ushered in an authoritarian regime, which, however, was... Um, was not anti-Jewish. And um, we can go into a little bit what Pilsudski accomplished. Uh, he did not abolish discrimination against Jews. There was certainly much. Uh, Jewish merchants were subjected to special taxation. Entire Jewish economic niches were nationalized. Tobacco, liquor, lumber, lottery, other kinds of uh, you know, traditionally Jewish pursuits. Um, Jewish businesses uh, were subjected to arbitrary inspections leading to their closure or expensive renovations. And I could go on and on. The, the point was to Polonize the economy by eliminating Jewish niches. And in fact, um, the Jewish proportion of merchants in, Polish, uh, in the Polish economy drops by 10% during Pilsudski's regime. However, he doesn't like anti-Semitism. Uh, it's bad for business, it's bad for the Polish image, and he protects Jews at a time when they had reason to fear for their physical security, having endured before his rise, during the rebirth of Poland in the uh, wake of World War I, pretty terrible pogroms, you know, with death tolls around 300, including cities like, uh, like Lviv, Lviv um, and Vilnius. Uh, death tolls in Lviv alone were as, was high as 150. Um, so so they, Jews in Poland really did appreciate what Pilsudski brought, which was security. It wasn't perfect, but he actually punished perpetrators of pogroms. Um, and so as a result, you know, to celebrate Pilsudski and really a kind of wishful thinking as well, uh, Schick produces this tremendous work the Statutes of Bolesław the Pious, which, or Bolesław Kalisk, which um, celebrates uh, the charter for admission the Jews into Poland in 1264 by Bolesław Pomudzny, also known as the Pious, um, which contained protections and privileges that were then echoed by later Polish leaders like Kazimierz the Great, and, uh, and um, then after the Union of Lublin uh, in the new Lithuanian territories as well. And uh, he goes on to sort of celebrate what Poland gets in return for its tolerance of Jews, that is Jewish contributions to the economy. Jews are artisans, Jews are merchants, and here you say they're, they're, they're loading grain, or they're grain merchants, which is anachronistic. Jews were not heavily involved in the grain train. That was dominated by the nobility, but still the idea is Jewish mercantile pursuits lend to the wealth and the well-being of Poland as it develops into the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And uh, when Poland is being reborn, Jews fight bravely in, uh, 
in, in the army, um, they also fight in Polish uprisings despite not being emancipated. And so, you know, he's celebrating many aspects of Polish contributions as, uh, sorry, Jewish contributions to Poland as a little bit of a quid pro quo for toleration, but still it's a celebration, it's a reminder of what now interwar Poland can be. And yet, what interwar Poland really was, was a mixed bag. You have the rise of right-wing ethno-nationalism, um, you know, celebrated by the Endek party. And here's just one, one snippet from a speech I found in the archives. The Polish regime, the police, were spying on these right-wing nationalist meetings, and they would record some of the speeches. And here's a pretty representative one. The current regime will collapse. A nationalist regime is coming. The new regime will expel Jews from Poland, and there will be no more unemployment, and Polish workers will at last find work. So it's, it's set as kind of a zero-sum game. And the, the banner they're carrying says, uh, it reads, Pracy i chleb Polakum, uh, work and bread for Poles, meaning Polish Catholics. After the death of Pilsudski, things really, really get unstable and dangerous for Jews. Um, you have a wave of pogroms, around 100, you know, depending on what you count as a pogrom, uh, 2,000 injured and 50 to 60 dead. I mean, estimates range from a dozen to, um, to something like 200, but this is, this is sort of what I found is the most representative number. It's not like Ukrainian pogroms, you know, in the, in the wake of World War I. It's not uh, the death toll that you found in other pogroms, but it's still very serious and is disillusioning because Poland had really come to be seen by Jews as a refuge, especially considering the rise of the Nazi regime uh, further westwards. Um, why were there pogroms? Well, a lot had to do with not just the perceived, but the actual Jewish representation in trade, and to a lesser extent, uh, crafts. You know, this is pretty amazing. Jews are 10% of the population, and even after Pilsudski's discriminatory measures against Jewish merchants, Jews still constitute um, over half of the merchants in Poland. I mean, they could be quite poor, but still this was seen as intolerable to those peasants who had obtained a modicum of education, wanted to move off their, their very small dwindling holdings and break into trade and other urban pursuits, and they find they just can't break in. You know, because Jews have long, long history of trade and, and networks and, and literacy and so on. Um, but the boycotts, the economic boycotts against Jews, which are endorsed by the government, cause a serious drop in Jewish ownership of shops and market stalls. This is from the town of Yedvabna, which many of you will have heard of because of what happens you know, during World War II. Um, but this is, uh, before all that, there's, there's a real economic assault on the Jewish community. As far as I know, there was not an outright pogrom in Yedvabna, but um, you know, their time would come. Um, so, and, and just this is something that I got from the Lublin archives is, um, you know, during, this is in the wake of Pilsudski's death, just daily assaults on Jews, which the police categorized as beatings, window breakings, uh, terror, and also terror against Christians who attempt to purchase from Jews as well, which is significant. It's an attack on the entire Jewish-Christian symbiosis. Bells are tolling. <laughs> Pshitik pogrom is the most notorious one. Um, their death toll is relatively low. There's you know, one Jewish couple is bludgeoned to death, um, but one Christian rioter or pogromist is also killed, uh, Vyeshnyak. And um, the, the real outrage is the trial afterwards in which the Polish pogromists are let off, even though they're eyewitnesses, and the Jewish self-defense fighters are actually sentenced to long sentences, like eight years of heavy labor for this one Jew um, who was accused of killing Vyeshnyak. And um, then there's another major pogrom in Minsk, Mazowiecki. I mean, this is just one of the most 
kind of newsworthy ones that, that everybody knew about, including Schick, of course. And, uh, you know, pretty serious wound, wounded, uh, very serious damages. Jews are being kind of driven out of the economy with the blunt instrument of pogroms at this point. And um, Life magazine publicizes it. Notice I didn't say Schick or Collier. Life magazine publicizes it. And, um, you know, there's, there is awareness that's being raised in the U.S. Uh, and then there's another major pogrom in Bzesch. And uh, this happens when th there was a, a ban on kosher slaughtering, and this one kosher butcher decided that uh, that, was, um, that was unacceptable, and he actually stabbed the police inspector. And so now the police are involved in the pogrom as well, just basically openly abetting the pogromists, and it's huge widespread destruction. Um, now, in America, the Joint Distribution Committee tries to do something about it, using capitalism, they're Americans. Uh, so they try to retrain Jewish merchants as artisans who are less resented. Uh, I don't know if this actually worked, but it seems to kind of be at least keeping this community afloat. And uh, you know, nobody knows that the Nazis are gonna invade and that the best thing to do is leave right now. So this is a good, I think, a good intentioned effort that may have been affected. Uh, there is an artist named Mark Chagall, who responds to these events in Poland um, and other parts of Europe as well, probably. But these are very kind of, they're often very specifically East European motifs. Chagall's white crucifixion does portray Jews as kind of the Christ figure, you know, the, the martyr who are once again being tormented and, and being crucified, I guess. And in the background, you'll see scenes of pogroms and scenes of Jewish refugees and exiles, the wandering Jew once again. Chagall is speaking out. Um, Schick is not. I don't necessarily want to do too direct a comparison. You know, Chagall is from Belarus. Belarus has been Sovietized now. He doesn't necessarily have a personal stake where Schick has family in Poland who could, I suppose, be affected. Um, but I do want to say that there are Polish Jews within Poland who are speaking out. For example, Mordechai Gebertik uh, writes a famous song, Is Brent in, in Yiddish. Uh, it is burning. Our town is burning. It's a call to arms to fight back. Nothing happens to Gebertik or his family. Um, you, could, you could talk about other, other voices as well. Bolesław Leszmian, the brilliant uh, Polish poet. You owe it yourself to, to discover him. Uh, he, he composes a, a, a poem this year uh, called Pogrom and you know, so on and so forth. So there are voices speaking out against it. And instead, Schick, of course, focuses on the martyrdom of the Polish nation as a good Polonophile. And it says, Posse Krzysztusowy Narodów, which is a, actually a miscitation from Mickiewicz, um, Poland is the Christ of the nation. So that's his, his sort of crucifixion, I suppose. Uh, he has another one that's in our exhibit uh, that has the famous slogan, Jeszcze Posse nie zginę which um, says, you know, Poland uh, will never die. And that was in 1942 when Poland had virtually died. And then it says, in the future, Poland will never die, and so on. So, so he, he's very, very courageous, outspoken in defense of Poland. Um, you know, here's another image from, uh, you know, another, another pro-Polish pro uh, sort of, uh, depiction, which is ironically very reminiscent of St. George killing the dragon in his statutes of Kalisk. Um, so, so why? I can't read his mind. I can't know his heart. I, I want to draw attention, though, to the problematics of diaspora existence uh, in general, not just Jews, but really any diaspora group. Perhaps we can learn something. It's different from being a colonized group. Uh, you're you're in a my, you're usually in the minority. I mean, the Caribbean is an exception, but you're usually in the minority. Um, it's 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 a feeling of being a guest in somebody else's house. Uh, there's a limit to how much you feel you can really speak out. So, with a sense of compassion, I'd like to try and understand that kind of silence. And uh, just to end with a quote by James Clifford about diasporas as counter discourses of modernity. 
diaspora cultures cannot claim an oppositional or primary purity. Fundamentally ambivalent, they grapple with the entanglement of subversion and the law of invention and constraint. And I think in this case, you know, Schick was showing a great deal of constraint. 